All right, this is OpenStax U.S. History, Chapter 14, Section 2, the Kansas-Nebraska Act and the Republican Party. So the debate over slavery in the Western territories was put to a rest, at least temporarily, due to the Compromise of 1850. Uh, according to that compromise, there essentially wasn't any territory left in the United States to argue about. Manifest destiny had been achieved, and um, you know the status of slavery in all the territories and states essentially had already been put there. Um, so things sort of died down just a little bit. Franklin Pierce was elected president in uh, 1852. Didn't really talk too much about the issue of slavery. Uh, he talked about this idea or this notion of young America, which was to spread democracy and acquire overseas lands. So, you know, the issue of slavery really wasn't uh, to the forefront of political debates, um, you know, after the Compromise of 1850. However, that all changed with the Kansas-Nebraska Act. And the Kansas-Nebraska Act might be the most consequential, maybe even the most important law that's ever been passed in American history. And the reason is because it revived the issue of slavery in a way that ultimately led to the Civil War. So we might say of the Kansas-Nebraska Act, this revived the issue of slavery. and sent the U.S. down the path of civil war. That's not to say that civil war was inevitable at this point, um, but certainly, you know, pushed the United States kind of down that, uh, down that trajectory. So what's the Kansas-Nebraska Act all about? Okay, so it begins with the desire to build a transcontinental railroad. This goes back to the idea of manifest destiny, wanting to link the United States from Atlantic to the Pacific. So the transcontinental railroad is a train or railroad that reaches from the Atlantic Ocean To the Pacific. And they were deciding where they were going to build this. Uh, whatever state or whatever city that the Transcontinental Railroad ran through, in all likelihood, would greatly benefit that city or state. Uh, there were Northerners who wanted to see this built in the North. One of them was Stephen Douglas, the same Stephen Douglas who was the hero of the Compromise of 1850. He was from Illinois. He wanted the train, we'll call it just the TR, Transcontinental Railroad, to go through Chicago, right? Whereas other, uh, namely Southern uh, congressmen, wanted the train to go through the South. So, you know, this was kind of a bid to try and see who can get it first. And so the Kansas-Nebraska Act initially was put forward as a way to create new states Kansas and Nebraska, so to create new states, in order to make way for the construction of this railroad. In fact, slavery was sort of an afterthought, and what Stephen Douglas did in his grave error in introducing this bill and eventually getting it passed was he greatly underestimated just how important the issue of slavery was to the nation. So what the Kansas-Nebraska Act did was it created two new states— and the idea was to get these states admitted to the Union as soon as possible to allow for the construction of this railroad. Uh, you know, construction or railroad companies certainly want some of the security uh, to know that there are certain laws on the books like taxes and stuff like that. It's much more, it's much less risky to build a railroad through a state than it is through a territory. So by speeding up the process, this was kind of a way to jumpstart this railroad project. Uh, in creating these two new states, Stephen Douglas proposed that the status of slavery would be up for popular sovereignty. That is, it would be voted on. And this is really the kind of key point 
in the Kansas-Nebraska Act is that um, it repealed a previous law set by Congress, and that was the Missouri Compromise. Because essentially this territory, we'll recall the Missouri Compromise set a line, right? The Missouri Compromise line, everything above the line was to be free soil. Everything below the line was to be slave. The two new states that were created, Kansas and Nebraska, they were on the free side of this line. So, you know, these were territories or states. Actually, I should write it um, right way. Kansas was more southern, right? Kansas, Nebraska. These were two states that were on the free side of the line. So according to Congress back in 1820, Kansas and Nebraska should have been free states. However, now, because this bill does pass, barely passes, I think by three votes or something like that, uh, now this territory that had previously been designated as free soil now is potentially open to slavery. And this was planned by Douglas because it was believed that Kansas, being a little bit more in the South, would vote for the pro-slavery position and Nebraska would be a free state. And so that would kind of appease everyone, right? Southerners would get one more uh, slave state, Northerners would get a free state, and Douglas thought that that would be okay. However, you know, this, uh, you know, setting the precedent of potentially taking free soil and turning it into slave soil, right, or where slavery was illegal, uh, legal, excuse me, that was really unprecedented, and that's really what Northerners could not stand for. You know, in previous debates, in most cases, there was territory that, you know, the legality of slavery hadn't been determined by Congress, all right? And, and it could go potentially either, you know, free or slave. This was something different, right? This was soil that was already designated as free soil and now was being opened up to the potential possibility. So the Kansas-Nebraska Act completely blew up the entire political system. You know, the Whig Party, it, for all practical purposes, really, you know, doesn't really exist anymore, right? It literally kills the Whig Party because Northerners and Southerners are so deeply divided on this issue. A new political party is created, the Republican Party. This is a new party um, created to oppose Kansas, Nebraska. And, you know, really what happens to the Democratic Party is that the Democratic Party becomes a, a purely sectional party, it becomes a party of the South, right? So we can think of the Republican Party really in this period as being the North Party and the Democratic Party, which, you know, existed in the age of Jackson and did have some Northern support, um, you know, more and more Northerners are moving away from the Democratic Party into this new party. But again, you know, this party is brand new. It takes a little bit of time for them to gain some popularity. But certainly in terms of consequences, a major consequence of Kansas, Nebraska is, you know, the ending of the second party system, right? So we might just take a note. I'll just uh, you know, sort of make a, a, quick, a quick blurb here. Kansas, Nebraska Act ends the second party system, right? And that, of course, is the Democrats and the Whigs. A party system is any time that um, two political parties are competitive throughout the United States. And, you know, it really means that there are only two games in town, so to speak. So that's consequence number one. Consequence number two is that, it, you know, it essentially leads to outright violence, the Kansas-Nebraska uh, Act does. In an episode called Bleeding Kansas, we can think of Bleeding Kansas as like the Civil War before the actual Civil War, all right? So it's like a, a mini Civil War, all right? The actual Civil War being from, you know, starting in 1861. So popular sovereignty is now the law of the land. People in Kansas, and Kansas is the contested state here because it borders Missouri, which is a slave state. Um, so Kansas is going to be under the uh, magnifying glass here, but they're going to vote on the status of slavery in Kansas. And so those people who are pro-slavery all move to Kansas in an effort to try and expand slavery. Those who are anti-slavery all move to Kansas and try to prevent it 
from going that way, and it turns into a bloody mess, right? Bleeding Kansas. So border ruffians, border ruffians are pro-slavery voters from Missouri, right? So these are people who cross over the border from the slave state of Missouri, cast an illegal ballot um, in favor of the pro-slavery state of Kansas, uh, and then, uh, you know, essentially go back. Uh, this results in the pro-slavery position winning. The Lecompton Constitution is the pro-slavery constitution. However, Northerners in Congress say that it was illegally voted for, right? That there were illegal ballots that were cast. Uh, the election is not legit, and therefore they won't recognize the pro-slavery state of Kansas. Meanwhile, you have Northerners who are sending uh, aid and people into Kansas to try to counterbalance the border ruffians. One example is the New England Emigrant Aid Society, we might say an anti-slavery uh, organization uh, to combat slavery in Kansas, you know, sending money and people to vote for the uh, free position, anti-slavery organization to combat slavery in Kansas. And this erupts in violence. Uh, ultimately, at the end of the day, Bleeding Kansas results in 150 people being killed. Again, these are pro-slavery. Oops. The reason why we call it the Civil War before the Civil War is because the violence is perpetrated by pro-slavery and anti-slavery supporters, right? So pro-slavery versus anti-slavery violence. And probably the most... Um, the most notorious incident of this was the actions of John Brown. John Brown believed himself to be a sort of an, you know, an anti-slavery abolitionist warrior of some sort sent by God in order to get rid of slavery. So we'll just call John Brown a radical and violent anti-slavery, I will just call him a person. And uh, at the Potawatomi Creek, an incident known as the Potawatomi Creek Massacre, uh, several pro-slavery people are killed by Brown. We'll say killed. Uh, running out of room here. By Brown. All right, John Brown kills a number of pro-slavery people, um, chopping them to pieces with uh, with swords. So all this violence ultimately spills over also into the Congress. Charles Sumner he is a northern senator. So in Kansas, right, you have incidents like the Potawatomi Creek Massacre, John Brown, pro and anti-slavery forces are going to Kansas and literally fighting for their side. 150 people are killed. Meanwhile, in the Congress, right, there are representatives from the North and the South who, up until this time period, these debates have gotten pretty heated, right? Um, but the um, what happened to Charles Sumner, what's known as the caning of Sumner, also adds to the violence. Charles Sumner gives a speech called The Crime Against Can uh, Kansas. He is a northerner, but also an abolitionist. In this speech, he really detests uh, Southern culture, the pro-slavery institution, and he attacks specific Southern senators. Uh, one, or, or, or you know, probably many people in the South believe that Charles Sumner went too far with this speech. One individual who wanted to protect and did defend the honor of those Southern senators who were called out was Preston Brooks. Preston Brooks was a representative member of the House, and he took his cane and beat the senator into a coma. So we'll say of Preston Brooks, he beat Charles Sumner. Into a coma. 
for his speech. Um, you know, this incident, the caning of Sumner, which is what it's called, um, you know, uh, Charles Sumner was seen as a martyr by Northerners. Uh, Southerners viewed Preston Brooks as rightfully standing up for the honor and integrity of the people that Charles Sumner um, insulted. Uh, it's also stated that people from around the South, or at least those people who supported what Brett, uh, Preston Brooks did, actually sent him new canes. So he got hundreds of new canes as a result of that. But, you know, the bottom line is to say that not only does Bleeding Kansas lead to, uh, you know, the the breakup of the political system or the breakdown of the political party system, but really outright violence between two sides, um, which really was unprecedented up until this point when it came to the issue of, you know, slavery in the Western territories. Um, so in 1856, the political system is a complete disaster. Uh, there's emergence of a new party, either called the American Party or the Know Nothing Party. This was an anti-immigrant party. Wanted to prevent the immigration, especially of Catholics from Ireland. Um, they end up getting a considerable number of votes, especially in northern cities. The Republican Party, which is new, it's an anti-slavery party. They run John Fremont. Again, there's not um, you know, this is a party that really popped up overnight. They still do pretty well in the election of 1856, given that they're brand new. You can see that here. They replaced the old Free Soil Party. This is a political cartoon about uh, slavery being forced down the throat of the Free Soiler. And lastly, the Democratic Party, they elect James Buchanan simply because he is the least controversial of the picks. He really wasn't around to debate the Kansas Nebraska Act, so he's seen as um, you know, uh, you know, a, a safe pick in some ways. Uh, Stephen Douglas, who had aspirations to become president, um, he couldn't run because you know the Kansas Nebraska Act was so toxic. You know, Stephen Douglas goes from being the hero to being the zero now with this law. Um, James Buchanan and the Democratic Party end up winning the election, but the problem about slavery in the Western territories. And the legality of slavery in Kansas, is it a slave state? Is it a free state? That remains, uh, that remains a question.